Dave Williams, deep sea diver here with today's video, suspension upgrades. When do I need to revalve or respring or chuck that shock altogether? Back in the day, only racers had adjustable suspension. So they knew some things that we didn't. We just had junk suspension that wasn't adjustable. It came with the springs it came with, it had the oil it had, it had the valving it had, and we just coped. Then in the late 90s, Adjustable suspension became available to even the little guy, okay? Now we all have it on almost everything. Only the most budget bikes come with non-adjustable suspension. And even then they have usually at least adjustable preload in the shock. But there was a time when we thought this adjustable suspension is so incredible only the fastest racers could ever override the suspension that comes stock on the umpty umpty squat R R R R R. okay? Turns out that's not true. Turns out that because of riding schools, because of better suspension, even the average street rider got faster. And so what was once only available to racers because it was so expensive was now available to everybody. Just like cell phones. In 1980, only the one percenters had cell phones, but now we all do. So now we all have adjustable suspension on most bikes and we all have the ability to override it. That was suspension myth number one, and it was born out of that era when we just got adjustable suspension, and so it didn't occur to us that we could ever ride faster, that we could ever ride as fast as racers ride. When do I upgrade my suspension? It turns out there is a narrow range. What worked for your weight at X speed is inadequate when you go that much faster. So you gotta upgrade the springs. Ditto the valving. That's the point of this video. When have I got a respring? When have I got a revalve? Dave knows all. Now, in regards to looking at a very simplistic graph, level of aggression, aftermarket parts replacement that need to go on your OEM bike. So, we're going to pick three basic motorcycles in terms of grouping to look at to realize when those investments levels need to occur. So let's take the new Ninja 400 that we looked at earlier today. If this is our baseline for every bike, if you're relatively aggressive, you can get away with it for a while, as we discovered with the forks and the fork oil. But pretty soon, you're gonna have to invest in the forks, and that's gonna be springs oil emulators. Then if your aggressiveness continues to pick up, you're going to have to buy a rear shock. So now on the 400, very early in its life, you're going to have to spend a lot of money to get that thing up to snuff based on your level of aggressiveness so the bike can stay ahead of you and you can continue to learn. Not a very unusual situation in regards to a very budget bike with basic components. Makes perfect sense. Now let's pick a standard, let's say an MT-10 from Yamaha. Basic componentry on the same, well, we don't have to rush into investment on that bike. It's got adjustable preload, rebound, compression, front and rear. So we've got some adjustability that we can work our way into, but at some point along that line, the first weak link in that bike is going to be a rear shock. So that's going to spike our graph financially because we're going to have to buy a rear shock or revalve respring. As we get going again, it's going to taper out a little bit, but then you're going to have to address the situation of the forks. And at some point there, you're going to have to do something with the forks. So again, our graph is going to rise up for the MT-10 because it's built as a standard motorcycle to do most everything but there's very upgraded componentry so that level of aggressiveness with the componentry slows down the rate of investment. Now let's pick something like uh, an Aprilia RSV4 Factory RF1100. Top of the line, Olin's components. Your level of investment generally is going to take a minute. You've got to learn that bike. You've got to learn all the electronics. You've got to find the right settings. Learning an 1100cc 
rocket ship, it's going to take a minute. So while your level of aggressiveness builds, it's going to build slower and it's going to take more time. At some point, you're going to need springs. And that could be for the front or the rear or both, depending on your ability and style. Then your learning curve continues upwards. And then at some point, you're going to need valving to compensate for the speed and potentially even harder springs. And then after that, if you are going to, for example, go really nuts and go to the track, then you might have to spike that to fit track only componentry, TTX shock, 30 millimeter fork kit to upgrade the componentry to meet the demands that the stock suspension might hit a limit on. Now, that being said, I didn't need to go all the way up here with my RSV4. I simply revalve resprung, and that got it to the level where it's perfect for me. So this last spike in complete replacements of forks and shocks never occurred to me as an expense because to me it wasn't necessary. So buy a basic bike, you've got to start investing early if you're going to be aggressive. Buy a standard motorcycle that's fully adjustable, it's going to take a little while longer, but each will have its Achilles heel of the initial investment, whether it's the forks or the shock. Buy something that's top flight, top tier in the 1,000cc category, and it's going to take a minute for you to figure out what your investment is and where it needs to go, because it also takes quite a while to learn how to ride that bike, use all the electronics, and build an entire package around that bike so you can leverage what you purchased. So let's take the tape measure numbers and use the whiteboard. And what do those numbers mean? So if our static sag was in the middle of the range, roughly at 10 millimeters, and our rider sag was 25 millimeters, that gives a total of 35. Our optimal range to start is 30 to 40. So we're okay, we get a check mark on that and it's not a problem. Now, if we put a rider on and we have zero static sag, absolutely nothing. And when the rider sits on the bike, it's 40 millimeters of rider sag alone. That's not acceptable. Even though it's in the range of 40, it's not going to work because all the static sag is gone and the rider is just going to get bucked out of the seat. That's a safety issue as well as a riding comfort issue. So with zero static sag and 40 mil, we have to go up one rate in spring. Maybe two, depends on the level of aggressiveness. So if you're commuting, go up one. If you're riding the twisties on the weekend, go up two rates. The flip side of that coin is that if your static sag is 20 millimeters and your rider sag is only 10 millimeters, that still gives us the ballpark number of 30 at the minimum range. But the static sag number is twice the rider sag number, and that's an imbalance that really doesn't work at all. So at that point, we need to go to a softer spring of one or two rates, again, depending on how you ride and your level of aggressiveness. So easy enough for you to contact your local suspension professional. They will have all kinds of information on springs and rates and be able to test the spring. And then through a discussion, you will figure out whether one spring rate up or down will be enough. And then the installation process can take place. You can use the tape measure again to assess where you are with a balance of static to rider, set it up, set the damping up, and then you're off and running with a much better situation in the shock using the Goldilocks zone of the middle two thirds of travel all the time. With a fork, how do we assess where we're at when we've started with our 30 to 40 millimeters to get us in the ballpark? The bottom line is, let's use an upside down fork, for example, with 120 millimeters of travel. If with that fork, you are using a portion of that travel, then if you are only using 60 millimeters of total travel all the time, and your preload is at zero, then obviously that spring is way too stiff because you can barely get past halfway. 
The goal is to get to two thirds to three quarters of your travel. In this case, we can't. Now, if you're using all 120 millimeters of travel and you are at 100% preload and your compression is almost closed, then the spring you have is way, way too soft. The difference there between using 30 to 40 and the actual physical travel you use comes down to braking efficiency, the brakes you have on your bike, how well you maintain them, and your braking skill in how well you use your brakes and how hard you can brake. So, assessing the next spring rate will be if you're using half your travel and that's the maximum, you need to go softer by one or two rates. If you're using everything and all the preload is in and most of the compression is in, you need to go stiffer by one to two rates. Now with the forks, there is a bit of a caveat here. One is how old is the fork oil and what is the fork oil level? And then secondly, what is the installed preload on that fork spring? And there's multiple videos for you on those specific topics to make sure that what's inside here in terms of the way it has been built is working correctly. So if all the engineering side is right and this is what you're faced with, that's how you determine whether you need a softer or a stiffer spring. Popular question. When do I go inside my forks and or shock and revalve? The heck is a revalve? The heck is a revalve? The heck, the heck, the heck, the heck, the heck is a revalve? Well, inside the cartridge and inside the shock, you have a system that controls oil flow. So if you're running stock suspension and you're servicing it regularly, you're always gonna have a total range of adjustment. So let's start with something that we use all the time, compression damping. If we have for our range for compression, three turns and as we improve with our motorcycle over time and become a better rider because we understand our bike better the settings are good so we can ride in a much more relaxed way we're inevitably going to ride faster which means we're going to brake harder or we're going to ride roads faster and we need our compression damping to work better because we're riding over that road surface faster. So generally we will go firmer on compression. So for OEM compression, you're normally going to start at somewhere around 50% 50, 50 of the range, which will be 1.5 turns. So you're right in the middle. As you go quicker, the suspension moves more. So you need to control that so the bike isn't wallowing up and down. So then all of a sudden now you're going to get into 25% of the, of the adjustment left. And if we're at 50 and we half that, we're now at 0.75 of a turn. That is all we have left. So we've used up 75% of our adjustment. So if we get down here in this area, this is where you need to pay attention. I am almost at maximum. If you're starting to get into this range, your ability, the pace you are riding the bike at, and your skilled activity in getting the bike through the corners, in braking and accelerating, when you're down to this setting, almost at maximum, you are getting better than it. That could be the forks, that could be the shock, it could be both. So as you track your settings, as you start getting close to this from maximum value, it is time for you to start putting cash away 
to go ahead and go inside the forks and or the shock and increase the ability of the component inside to have a much greater influence over oil flow control, especially in regards to velocity. And now in regards to rebound damping itself. So how does all this work? Okay, first thing, what is our total range? So the first thing we're going to do with the motorcycle is set it to our weight. So we're going to set number one, our spring tension. And what that's going to do is set the amount of stored energy that when the fork collapses, it will ping back with. Because pretty much every bike on the planet comes with a progressive spring in the front forks. So as we set that tension, we also preset the energy release. So if we've set our spring tension and we are at 50% of the total range, so we're at 1.5 turns, then we're fine. We're right in the middle of adjustment. But if we have to go to 0.75 of a turn just to set our rebound damping optimally even with brand new oil then all of a sudden without even riding here we're already almost at maximum so if we are talking about revalving and going in the adjustment here of setting that rebound almost to maximum tells us something isn't right because we haven't even ridden the bike yet. So the question becomes, is the oil too thin? Is that the issue? Or if the oil is fresh and you're here to control it, what do we need to do? We need, and what is happening is the oil's coming in that direction in a way in which we can barely control. So we have to go back in and revalve to give more control over that oil flow and get ourselves from here back to the middle of the range. So again, as you're getting up to almost maximum, it's time for you to start putting that cash away to be able to revalve, rebound, especially when you have a progressive spring in your forks. Now in regards to the shock, you have a progressive linkage you may also have a very progressive spring. So if you're here in the settings for the shock and you're almost all the way in so it doesn't jump up in the air, you still have to go in and revalve rebound because your final setting is too close to maximum or closed. Schedule a remote tuning appointment for you and your bike with Dave via text, email, Facebook, etc. Contact Dave on Facebook or by email, dave at davemosstuning.com.